Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week will be Paulina Hermilo, who is an assistant professor of research at Carnegie Mellon University. Paulina will talk to us on valuation of plug-in vehicle life cycle air emissions and oil displacement benefits. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Professor Duncan Calloway, who is an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Duncan received his PhD in theoretical and applied mechanics from Cornell University in 2001, following which he did a postdoc, and as a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California at Davis. After that, he spent four years working in the industry and worked with the Davis Energy Group and also the Power Light Corporation. He was on the research faculty of the University of Michigan from 2006 to 2009. That's another uh, four years. And then uh, in 2009, he joined the Energy Resources Group as an assistant professor uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. He also holds a uh, courtesy appointment in the mechanical engineering also at UC uh, Berkeley. His research and teaching focus on a wide range of energy issues, but really the focus is on using and designing new control strategies, new configurations uh, for improving the efficiency of energy systems and also for increasing the utilization of renewable resources. We really look forward to uh, what you have to share with us, Duncan. And it's, it's really, uh, there are several groups in different departments and schools here at UT that have very, very overlapping interests. So we are especially delighted that uh, you are able to join us here today. OK, it's a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> Hold your applause till the end. Hopefully, you'll still clap at the end. <laughs> um, OK, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here and um, to learn about um, just the tip of the iceberg of all the projects that are um, happening that, that do indeed overlap with my own interests. Um, today, I will be talking about um, some efforts, uh, recent efforts that we've um, undertaken to understand photovoltaic variation using large data sets. And then um, I'll also talk about some uh, other efforts to deal with variability from photovoltaics using uh, demand side control. Uh, and this is work largely um, in collaboration with my students, Mark Dyson, uh, Johanna Matthew, uh, who um, has actually graduated, will be an assistant professor at Michigan uh, Electrical Engineering in uh, January, uh, and Michelangelo Tibone. Um, and it's work supported by the California PUC and the Department of Energy. Uh, so, so some of you, or maybe even all of you, may um, have seen figures like this before, but I find it, having been actually um, it, exposed to the PV industry for um, over a decade now, um, intimately involved in one way or another, um, these numbers are staggering to me. Um, and uh, if, if you think about what's happening in terms of the capacity expansion of photovoltaics, um, it's really startling. So we see in the US over seven gigawatts total installed, 3.3 gigawatts alone in 2012 um, were, were installed. The costs, I think, are what are the most amazing. So we're, we're approaching $2 a watt installed for utility scale PV. Residential across the country is $3. Probably by now it's even less. Module costs alone are 70 cents. Um, and the forecast is for two, another four gigawatts in 2013. Um, if we look at California alone, we have a goal there of getting on the order of 12 gigawatts of distributed photovoltaics by 2020. So um, these are big numbers, and it's clear that uh, um, the economics are, are, are working out pretty well. Um, but as, as some of you may also know, there are issues with respect to what happens in the operation of distribution systems and um, large-scale power systems when we put a source of power on the grid that is both variable and uncertain. And so uh, this is the, an, uh, our own plot, but maybe you've seen similar ones with other data where we've taken with the red the output of um, a single uh, PV system, photovoltaic system, uh, and plotted that this is one-minute data on a partly cloudy day. And you can see that there's extraordinary vol uh, volatility there. Um, and the question that we wanted to understand and that I'll talk about how we tried to come at this in the first part of the talk is wh what happens so clearly as, as we go from just one site to 15, you can see that there's a reduction in that volatility because we're averaging over space. 
So what we, will, what we want to understand is as we go to very large spatial scales, how does that averaging or how does that reduction of volatility scale? And what does it then mean for power system operators and what they have to do um, in the future? So, um, so this uh, motivates then the, the two parts of my talk. So in the first part, um, just a couple of additional bullets. So of course, to the extent there's variability and uncertainty coming from photo photovoltaics on power systems, we need to balance that with something, whether it's storage or generation, or as I'll talk about in the second part, demand side resources. But the question is, how much do we need to balance? Um, a few st recent studies in California have suggested that it could be as much as four gigawatts of new flexible capacity needed by 2020 to deal with our renewables targets. So um, uh, this, is, this is not renewable generation capacity. This is additional flexible, potentially combustion turbines or combined cycle turbines that can ramp quickly, just for the, not for meeting peak demand, but just for the purpose of providing uh, flexible generation. Uh, and this could come at a cost of um, maybe perhaps $2.50 to $5 per added megawatt hour. These are recent studies that suggest that that's what it could be for wind at low penetration levels. At higher penetration levels and adding PV into the mix, we have much less certainty about what things will look like. So in the first part of the talk, I'll go into um, our most recent analysis of PV variability to try to at least hang a number on how much flexible capacity we need. Uh, for different configurations of uh, PV in, um, uh, in, in the state of California. Um, okay, so then after we, I give you some numbers and suggest how much we actually need, I'll talk about a potential solution for balancing that variability. Um, and this is one that I've been working on for several years now, and I'll just talk about some of the most recent things uh, that we've been studying, where the basic objective is to say, well, there's variability and uncertainty coming from wind and solar, can we get a perfect match between consumption of electricity uh, and the, that variability? So can we get load, that is, to respond um, to the variable production from renewables? So the, the reason that I think this is a really compelling area to be working in is because the infrastructure in many ways, and I'll talk to you in more detail about how this is quite true in the case we're looking at, the infrastructure is there. That is, certainly the load is there, um, and in many cases, uh, all of the communication control infrastructure we need is there, and it's just a matter of setting up uh, the, the correct algorithms um, to get the responses that we want. Uh, so um, in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll go into some detail um, on the models that we're using to do load aggregation, state estimation control, but then also um, I'll talk about uh, some of the efforts that we've done to try to quantify the size of this flexible demand resource, um, again, in the state of California. Okay, so let's dive into part one. This is a really, this is the best figure that I have to describe this concept, but it's still a messy one. And so um, I'm gonna walk you through it. I, I want you to pay only attention to the green line, the blue line, and the red line. And the, what this figure shows you is how system operators think about balancing variability and uncertainty on power systems at a cartoon level. So if you, the green line, let me start just by describing, this, is, this might be what actual uh, demand or demand minus renewables generation, basically all the stuff that system operators can't control in a power system um, in most cases. So that green line would be what actually shows up in real time. And so what a power system operator would do would be an hour in advance or even a day in advance forecast what that green line would be, but only its hourly average, right? So that's the red line. So the red line is an hour of the system operator's best estimate of what, uh, on average, it's going to have to produce from its coal plants, its gas plants, its hydro plants um, in some. And then as we actually approach the moment of operation when we're 10 minutes away, the system operator issues a new forecast that is uh, in a five-minute block, and that's what the blue line is. So every five minutes, we have a new forecast of what we think that our combustion turbines and our coal plants and our hydro plants in aggregate will have to be doing to respond to the demand minus renewable signal. Um, and so we call this difference between the red line and the blue step line uh, load following. I'm gonna talk about a lot about load following in the first part of this talk. Um, 
And in many places, uh, it's, we, we redispatch generation economically to deliver that flexibility. So we say, who's the cheapest generator that can respond um, if we need an increase in generation, or who's the most expensive generator that can respond if we need a reduction, um, and we dispatch generators accordingly. Then, of course, though, there's still a difference between the blue and the green line, um, and that is something that we make up for calling uh, with something called frequency regulation, or for short, just regulation. Also, in other parts of the talk, I'll call it automatic generation control, or AGC. And that final acronym um, sort of suggests how the process actually works. We've got a, a large fleet of generators with, um, that are plugged into an automatic control loop that can assess the size of the imbalance between what's being supplied and what's actually being demanded and dispatch generation automatically, not necessarily economically, but automatically to cover that gap. So we have then difference between the red and the blue load following, difference between the blue and the green frequency regulation. And those are two things that system operators think a lot about when they worry about the impacts of more wind or more uh, variable PV generation on the system because they worry that they're going to have to dispatch more flexible capacity to deal with things on the load following and the frequency regulation time scale. Okay. Um, so for this first part of the talk then, um, the focus will be, and this is in large part meant to contrast what we've done, uh, what, what we're doing relative to how people have approached the problem in the past. We're going to focus on understanding the operational impacts. And what I mean by operational impacts is load following and automatic generation control. How much more do we need? with distributed photovoltaics. So earlier studies have basically just described the statistics of the process, but haven't mapped it to power system requirements. Um, we'll also be using um, a real distributed PV production data set. Uh, and this is what motivated the first phrase in the title. Um, and I'll describe that in a little bit. Um, we'll do our analysis both on very small spatial scales um, and on very large spatial scales. So we'll look at uh, I'll describe this in more detail, but geographic autocorrelation on small spatial scales, and then we'll assess impacts on very large spatial scales. Um, and one additional thing is that rather than just describing the statistics of the renewable generation process, we're actually going to build a model, and ultimately you'll see what it is, but it's something like a Gaussian mixture model um, of PV production. So I'll get there in a little bit. Let me first describe um, the first sort of phase of the data that we work with to build the model itself. So we have from a uh, photovoltaic integrator uh, um, that we work with in California, um, data, one minute production data from PV systems from their customers, and these are mostly residential customers, um, on very small spatial scales. So these squares are on the order of 256 square kilometers. And we have systems, we did a sort of stratified random sampling to get systems from within all of the systems they have, so the gray circles are all the systems that they have at the point in time that we did the sampling. And the red ones are the ones that we actually chose um, to do the sampling from, this one minute resolution sampling. Uh, and we, did, we wanted to get um, a good distribution of very, very small distances apart and larger distances within this area. So that's why we did the stratified random sample. Uh, so we, we have um, a certain number for uh, coastal regions in California, San Jose and Los Angeles, but then also in the Central Valley. Um, and we'll use this to create our small, our small spatial scale model. So the basic way that we do that is, uh, or the first step at least, is to decompose the production from an individual PV system into pieces that look like automatic generation control and load following. And so this is looking a lot like that figure that I showed you before where the red dashed line is the um, hourly average, but with, it, with a 20 minute ramp in between, which is what system operators use to move generators around. Uh, the black line is the five minute average, and then the blue dotted lines are the actual one minute production. And so we just take those averages and then subtract them out to get uh, an AGC signal and a load following signal. Um, and one thing that I, I need to say very clearly here um, that uh, motivates future work, but that you may be wondering, is that we're assuming that there is no forecast error in the sense that this red dashed line is a perfect forecast of the hourly average. And the black, um, well, it's the points on the black line that are a perfect forecast of the five-minute average. And the reason that we did that is that we wanted to just understand the 
underlying PV production process without having to make any assumptions about the kind of forecast models that people are using. Um, but it's something that we're actively doing right now to build forecast error on top of that. But you can see that there's still plenty of variability even if you assume, that is, there's plenty of variability in the difference between the actual signal and the five minute average, or the five minute average and the one hour average. Um, okay, so the basic approach then is to parameterize the probability distributions of each of those impacts. So what is the amount of automatic generation control capacity we needed at each time in megawatts? Or how much load following did we need at each time in megawatts? Try to parameterize a probability distribution of that and then to use that to predict the extreme impacts in future hours. We want those extremes so that we can say how much, what's the worst case? How much are we gonna have to build in terms of flexible capacity in the future, okay? Um, so the hard part though is that the distributions are really complicated um, and there's no simple parametric way to describe those distributions. So if we wanna do some sort of forecasting, especially out in the tails, we need to figure out a way to resolve that complexity in the distributions. Um, uh, and that, that's the really hard part. So um, when we started thinking about this problem, one of the first things that we did is we, you know, we said, okay, well, what does a day of production from a PV system look like? This is a very typical production pattern um, in the coastal regions of California where you have morning fog, partly cloudy, and then sunny in the afternoon. So um, what you can see though is that there's a very, you know, just eyeballing it, you can see there's very clear regimes. You know, the cloudiness, it's clear that it was cloudy at that point in time just by eyeballing it. It's clear that this is highly volatile and partly cloudy. And later on, it's obvious that it was sunny. So we said, well, what are those, what do the distributions look like within those periods of time? When it's partly cloudy, when it's cloudy, when it's sunny. And, um, the problem with that question is that we don't actually know with that well, so we can eyeball it. We can say, well, it looks like it's, a, it's sort of partly cloudy at this point in time, but we've got lots and lots of systems and lots and lots of time, and to go through by hand and eyeball everything is an unworkable solution. So um, instead, what I'll show you is that we, we built a model that basically estimates endogenously what the weather regime is from the data, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But the hypothesis, though, is that if we can describe then when we're in each regime, that maybe those distributions are something that we can parameterize easily. Um, so the way that we built up our model then is that we uh, put together a, a relatively standard hidden Markov modeling framework, where the idea is that we have uh, what we call hidden states that describe at each time what the so-called volatility state of the system is. And we don't assign volatility state to either cloudy or sunny or partly cloudy conditions. We don't actually make that value judgment, if you will. But you can think of it in that way. That is, either it's really volatile or it's really, it's not volatile. But these are discrete states that the model will choose endogenously. So it looks at the data um, and it says, what is the most likely state that um, the system is in? And then it fits a, uh, uh, um, a Gaussian model in this case to the distribution that we get for each uh, possible state that it could be in. Um, so these hidden states are the volatility states. The Ys are the actual observations. That is the AGC or the load following signal. And then the Ws are some exogenous inputs that we use to basically try to guide the model into identifying the correct state um, and especially, in, we'll use this later on for doing simulations outside of the spatial and time scale that we actually have built the model in. Uh, because in, 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 some, in larger spatial and time scales, we do have some exogenous data that I'll describe to you, actually, I think, on the next slide. So, um, okay, so the basic idea is that we want a model that describes how we transition from one state to another, and that's the Markov process. And then given a state, we get some output, some volatility, and that's the Gaussian process, okay? Um, so what should our exogenous inputs be? Let's describe that really quickly. So we have, in addition to those short time scale, small spatial scale data, we have from the, our PV partner, roughly 7,000 sites throughout the state of California with 15 minute time scale resolution. And so in that case, uh, we can cover much more of the state. And it turns out that, in fact, um, 
we can cover about 40. So if we, if we divide this data into a bunch of four kilometer square boxes, and we say, how many of those boxes have 15 minute data in it from our partner, from our PV integrator? Um, the answer is that we get about 40% of the population of the state of California in that process. So, um, so, so it's a pretty good coverage data set. So in this case, the gray boxes are places where uh, there's um, significant population in the state, and then the red boxes are where we also have data. So you can see there's good overlap. Um, so we'll use this 15-minute data, and specifically the observed volatility of the 15-minute data as exogenous inputs into our model that will give the model some information about how it should be transitioning from one uh, volatility state to another. So here's the basic model and the equations that we estimate. So we define uh, the, what we call the clear sky requirement. That is, if there were no clouds in the sky, how much load following and how much automatic generation control would there be? That's easy for us to estimate just using solar geometry. Um, and so then, uh, so we define clear sky um, volatility. And then we assume that the actual volatility is a multivariate Gaussian function with mean of the clear sky volatility and then a gigantic variance covariance matrix that is a function both of this hidden volatility state, that is, is it cloudy, is it partly cloudy, partly sunny, and then also a parameter phi that defines the spatial or geographic autocorrelation. And I'll describe that in just uh, actually in right now I can do it. So, so this, this um, variance covariance matrix for this multivariate Gaussian function, as I said, is a function of the hidden volatility state, but then also an exponential geographic autocorrelation function. Basically what that's saying is that, you know, if you happen to be producing a lot um, here, you're likely to be producing a lot here. You're a little bit li less likely to be producing a lot here and even less likely over here. So there's a, there's a spatial um, decay, and that's just because if you think about cloud patterns, um, obviously, you know, if you've got a big cloud over you, your neighbor's likely to have a big cloud as well, but you go a kilometer away and that neighbor is less likely. Um, and that's what this exponential um, autocorrelation function describes. So it's a function of distance between sites, D, um, and some parameters we estimate, A um, and tau, is basically how quickly things decay off. So the, the process for estimating the model then is that we, um, we have to estimate endogenously to the model um, the probability of being in a volatility state, the variance of each volatility state, and then a transition matrix. This is just a Markovian state transition matrix. It says, given what I knew or what I thought my volatility state was in the previous time step, T minus one, and my exogenous inputs, I have some probability of moving to another probability, uh, volatility state. It's just a simple Markovian process. Um, so, so this is a model that we can estimate with a bit of computational effort, but in a relatively straightforward way using expectation maximization. Um, and, uh, and then separately, once we fit that model, we go back and we say, okay, now that we know each volatility state or the most likely volatility state, we get um, the parameters of that geographic autocorrelation function. Um, so here's just an example of what the actually... Um, this is an example of the result where we're characterizing different volatility states. But the main thing that I want to show you here is that we looked at different models. What if we have three, what if the model can choose three volatility states, four volatility states, five, six, or seven? And what um, I'm plotting on the y-axis is the increase in log likelihood of the particular model that we identify. So what you can see is that when we go from five to six, the increase in log likelihood is really small. And so we use that as our threshold. We said, okay, five's a pretty good number. Because when you go to six, we don't, there's not much of a return in terms of the power of the model to predict what's going on. Um, and this is just one way of validating what's going on. So let me take just a second to describe what um, you're seeing here. So these are called QQ plots or quantile quantile plots. Um, and the way to think about it is that on the x-axis, this is the number of standard deviations away from the mean that an observation, or sorry, that uh, a simulated uh, data point is from the model that we parameterize. And then on the y-axis, it's the number of standard deviations from the mean of an actual observation, okay? 
So this first box here is showing um, a comparison between what the model would simulate and what we actually use to parameterize that model. Um, because it's on the line y equals x, that says that the distributions that the model creates and the actual distribution are very well related. They're, they're very close to each other. Um, and then what we see here, though, is that when we compare to test data, what I mean by test data is that we, um, we actually reserve 25% of the data from our data set um, to test. So we, we build the model with 75% of the data. We randomly choose another 25% to test against the output of the model. And you can see then also that the distribution of the test data um, is very close to what the model predicts. Um, but this was done assuming that we actually know what to choose as the volatility state. That is, which distribution are we going to be using at any point in time? And we get that from the model estimation process. So we were sort of, we had this challenging situation where we said, well, if we want to extrapolate to other times and, and places, we won't actually know what that volatility state is. And so we looked at a few different ways of trying to simulate what they might be. In one case, we said, well, what if we just take the stationary distribution from the Markov process, which is, so remember, we fit a Markovian state transition matrix for the volatility states. What if we take the stationary distribution from that and just assume that each site is um, in each volatility state according to that distribution, but it, those sites aren't correlated with each other. That is, if my volatility state here is one, I'm no more likely to be in a, a one volatility state over here. There's no correlation. So in that case, we said, well, what, if we assume that, what do things look like? And you, what this is showing us is that the tails of the model distribution are not as fat or not as heavy as the tail of the actual data. So when we assume that there's no correlation in volatility state, we get a little bit less volatility in aggregation, which makes sense because um, what I'm doing is not as correlated to my neighbor as it actually is in practice. And so then we also said, um, what if instead everybody has the same volatility state in a three kilometer square? Um, so we, we simulate volatility states and we just choose in a three kilometer square the most volatile of those simulated ones. And in that case, the tails are fat. That is, the distribution itself uh, that, we, that we simulate has, a longer, has wider tails than the actual data. So what this gives us is a way of creating bounds on what actually happens in practice. Because what we care about are the extremes um, here and here. And we can see that, at least empirically, we can see that if we use this way of simulating volatility states, we get a lower estimate on the, on the aggregate volatility. And if we use this way of estimating volatility states, we get um, uh, an, a, a higher estimate of the aggregate volatility. So one thing that I, I should have made clear, I think, I'm not sure if I said this, that these distributions are for a collection of sites within a large area. So it's not just for one individual site. It's, so it's the sum of their output. OK. Um, yeah, question. Yeah. All of these have that exponential decay function built in. So the, the, this is, a, as I said, it's a, this large multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the correlation between the output of one site and another goes according to that exponential decay. That's for all of them. Now, the thing that, um, that we don't have an explicit model for is the correlation. So we have a way to model the correlation in the output given the volatility state. But we don't have a way to model the correlation in volatility states yet. So that's sort of a future thing to work on. And so these were just two extreme ways of saying very, very low correlation in volatility states and very high correlation in volatility states. OK. Um, OK, so then uh, extrapolation. Now, how, what balancing capacity do we need in the future? So this was our ultimate goal once we built that model. I validated the model to some extent on the previous slide. What we want to do then is say, what if we cover the whole state of California with 12 gigawatts of distributed PV? Or what if we wanted 12 gigawatts of PV in the state, and we had different scenarios for how it was distributed throughout the state? We can get at that with this model. Um, so, uh, and, and we use that with our 15-minute exogenous inputs to basically drive the evolution of the volatility states 
using that 15-minute data. Um, okay, so we investigated a couple of different PV arrangements. In one, we said, what if the um, systems are completely distributed? That is, we basically randomly distribute PV within uh, four kilometer square or two kilometer by two kilometer square cells. And then what if we said, well, within each cell, we're gonna concentrate all of the PV at one point or at whatever spatial area is required to get enough PV such that it, when we add up the PV in all the cells, we get to 12 gigawatts. That's the community scenario. So it's like a four kilometer square community has one large PV system. And then the third scenario that we looked at is we said, well, what if we just went to the part of the state with the best resource, which is the Mojave Desert, and we stuck it all there. So we just sort of cluster it all into one place. So it goes between different kinds of spatial arrangements and the autocorrelation function, it turns out, drives pretty different outcomes. And so then we use those scenarios to make predictions for how much AGC and load following we'll need just for that 12 gigawatts of PV in 2020. Okay, so this is the result. So, um, so there are three sets of three bars to look at. So the first set of three bars is uh, what would happen if we balance all of the variability at the level of the state of California. That is, we take the sum of the output of the PV and we balance that total sum in the whole state. The middle bars say, well, what if, um, the balancing happened at the level of a county. And that was, we chose that level just because the GIS software made it easy to say what's a county. We don't know, uh, uh, we don't have power systems information in our GIS software. But there are reasonable spatial scales that are comparable to a county that you might do balancing at within a power system. Uh, and then this one says, well, what if you do all of the balancing at the level of this four kilometer square area? So to the extent there's variability within the systems within a four kilometer square area, we're gonna balance it all out. We're gonna smooth it all out with resources in that four kilometer square area such that the sum of the balancing and the PV in that area is constant. Okay, so as you can see, as you might expect, as you scale up to, or as you scale down to smaller and smaller balancing areas, you need more and more capacity because we're not leveraging the fact that there's uh, some spatial averaging that goes on over large scales. So in the, if we balance at the state level, one way to read this is that, um, uh, I, I don't wanna go into describing each individual bar yet, but we need roughly 10% of the installed PV capacity available to balance that variability. If we balance at the level of four kilometer square areas, we need something that's more like 70% of the capacity. So let me then go in and describe, I, I've already given you a sense of what these distributed community and centralized scenarios are. So this is if we put all of the PV randomly distributed throughout the state. This is if it's clustered at certain points in the state and then this is if it's all in the Mojave Desert. Um, and you can see that the spatial autocorrelation function is driving this increase. So when we put everything in one place, uh, we, get, we need more balancing capacity, almost 20% of the installed PV capacity. So that's on the order of two gigawatts or two or three gigawatts. Um, whereas if we go distributed, we need something that's more like 7%. Uh, and that's again, if we do state level balancing. So um, let me see. So just a couple of comments then. Of course, as you might expect, but we can quantify it formally here. If you balance locally, you need more balancing capacity. And the reason that that's important is because you, you might think you know, intuitively, of course, why would you balance locally? Because you would expect to get this spatial averaging, but there is a drive to put um, customer sited storage behind the meter and to use that storage to balance out, or some people think it would be a good idea to use that storage to balance out the volatility of individual PV systems. And this basically says, oh, you can do it, but it comes at a really big cost in terms of how much capacity you need, right? Uh, basically an order of magnitude cost. Um, so, but then also, th I think that this tension between distributed and centralized is really interesting because as you might expect, if you go centralized, um, the Mojave Desert has a lot of environmental impact problems, but, um, and I'm gonna acknowledge those, but then put them aside for a second and just say, if you go to the Mojave, the solar resource is much better, right? So you don't have to install as much PV. So it's a more cost-effective, potentially, way of getting that solar energy. 
but it comes at a cost in terms of how much additional balancing capacity you need. Um, so, uh, and then one final thing that I uh, want to say is that if you look at the distributed scenario at state level balancing, this amount of variability, it turns out, um, and I don't have the figure here, but it turns out that it's driven almost entirely by the fact that the sun just changes position in the sky, right? It's not, so that amount of variability is the amount of variability that you get due to the clear sky variation only. Okay, so, um, so another way to think about it then is that to the extent there's cloudy and partly cloudy conditions is completely washed out if you go to the distributed state level balancing scenario. So I think that's pretty profound because that actually suggests that we need very little sort of fast response resources because you can predict what the clear sky variability is going to be, right? Um, so uh, so th this was a surprising result, I think, to us that, we've, that we found that there is potentially, although our percentage is 7%, that's relatively high compared to what some people think it might be, it's all driven by clear sky variability. Okay, yeah, another question. None. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Where? So where would I locate? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. But the. So if if your concern is about transmission constraints and sort of do you do we need to worry about where we locate the generation? Right. Right. It could potentially be, and in fact, they're moving to that sort of a model right now, um, where you could do balancing with out-of-state resources. But um, just one little anecdote, at least, is that um, most large-scale system operators, actually all that I know of, um, procure the resources to do this kind of balancing in very large areas. They don't actually distinguish. Location doesn't matter so much because um, this is short time scale variability and short time scale um, transmission constraints aren't a terrible problem. They have enough time to reallocate generation um, on longer time scales to mitigate those constraints. So to the extent that it's so first of all, you'd have to be in a situation where you are transmission constrained and you need balancing capacity to go from one place to another. Um, those are relatively infrequent, but even in that case, if that causes you to violate a transmission constraint, it's typically just a thermal constraint and it's one that you can bear for five minutes and long enough to redispatch the rest of the system. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. It was whatever was in our data. Yeah. So um, most of them were south and southwest. Yeah. Um, okay. So interpretation, um, uh, 12 gigawatts of PV, uh, I think, is, is quite doable in terms of reserve requirements, especially in that distributed state-level balancing. But some caveats are that we've only looked at balancing uh, PV, not net load. So to the extent PV and load that is, demand might be correlated, we haven't captured that, and that's actually something we're actively working on now. Um, and then also the estimates are upper bounds assuming a perfect forecast. So adding forecast error would certainly increase the estimates. Uh, and then finally, we're focusing on um, getting maxima over long time scales, but I think it would be interesting to use this type of an approach for sort of day ahead control room um, uh, uh, planning processes. So, um, okay, part two, and Varuna and I were talking about how we overshoot the, we always overestimate, it seems, how much we can say in an hour. Um, just starting on part two, and I've got um, about 10 minutes left. Okay, so I, I, can, I can get you guys through this, um, I think, without it feeling like too much of a whirlwind. So, um, so okay, suppose we have, let's assume we have some variability, we need to balance it. One option is that we use as the gentleman in the back suggested, we use a combined cycle turbine or a combustion turbine to ramp up and down. That requires operation at part load, poor heat rates, um, and poor, uh, worse capacity factors. So in general, more CO2 emissions, bad economics. So 
it's certainly doable and it may be ultimately the best option, but there are others. One is to use energy storage to manage the problem. But another is to coordinate the demand side to balance the variability. And that's something that um, is compelling enough that it's not necessarily the only answer, but I think it's compelling enough that we've been working on it for the past few years. Um, so the, the basic problem in a nutshell, that um, the way that I like to say it is that system operators want a lot of visibility into what resources they're dispatching are doing. But um, the kind of equipment that they require to do that is very expensive. That is what, this is um, a remote terminal unit for a generator. Um, and this plus the other infrastructure you need to plug into a system operator's energy management system can cost upwards of $70,000. So it's completely untenable to think that individual loads could have this kind of equipment. Um, so um, our, the solution that we've been thinking about is to say, well, what if um, instead of metering individual loads, we meter, sorry, I've got two things in my hands to move around. Um, we meter substation power. And then we've got a number of thermostatically controlled loads, some of which we directly control and others which we don't, um, on that distribution substation. So this little hysteresis loop down here is meant to represent the operation of a simple heating thermostatically controlled load. So temperature on the x-axis, on-off state on the y. It's this sort of thing which so many thermostatically controlled loads operate on that we're interested in modeling and controlling. And so then the idea is that if you can do some state estimation at the point of the distribution substation and use that to compute control signals to broadcast out to the loads, you can potentially go from a power consumption profile that looks like this at the substation to one that looks like this and matches what a system operator is asking you to do. Um, so, uh, so let me actually just dive right into what a model would look like to do this. So this is a model that we've spent a fair bit of time working on where this is meant to represent that hysteresis loop I was just saying. In this case, we are cooling, right? Because when the devices are off, we're saying they're warming up, and when they're on, they're cooling off. So this would be a refrigerator, an air conditioner, uh, or a freezer. Um, and then what we model is the rate at which um, devices in a population of loads move from one temperature state to another, and we discretize these states so that we can write things down um, using, uh, again, something that looks sort of like a Markov, or Markov model. So the idea is that X describes a fraction of TCLs, or thermostatically controlled loads, in each temperature bin. A says, in the absence of control, how does a distribution evolve in time? So given one distribution, that is, if you've got all of your loads here, A is going to say where they're going to be on the next time step. Um, and then Y is the output. This is what we actually observe, which is the power consumption from the aggregation. And this is what we call a linear time invariant model. Um, and this is something that people have been working on for many decades in the control theoretic literature. And it gives us a lot of horsepower in terms of applying control theoretic tools to the system. Um, and then what is U? So U is a control vector. And so the idea is that we could broadcast a signal to loads that says that if you are about to turn off, that is if your temperature state is, sorry, if you're about to turn on, if your temperature state is warm, you're getting ready to turn on, do it a little early. And that's what these um, red things are saying, suggesting send these loads from here to here. And if you're about to turn off um, and we want a reduction in power, do it a little early. So this would cause an increase in power on the substation. This would cause a decrease in power. And that's what the control signal can initiate. Um, so let me just uh, suggest what a possible trajectory might look like. So this is simulating over the course of a day variation in outside air temperature. I don't have temperature labeled on this axis. I apologize. Um, and then uh, this is what a thousand thermostatically controlled air conditioners would do if we didn't control them uh, according to this type of a scheme. And then this is what they do if we simulate uh, some, the dissemination of a control signal to all of them, where the way that, in this case, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but the way that we decided what that control signal would be is uh, in order to minimize exposure to real-time price. So this is actual real-time price information from the California Independent System Operator in, um, at a node in Merced in California. So this is just an example of going from 
something that's relatively smooth variation to something that's quite variable. But the key thing that I should have said before is that we're always assuming that we're staying within the original temperature dead band, right? So we're not causing presumably discomfort. We're just sending things on and off a little bit at different times than they would have otherwise. One thing that people often raise concern about, and I'm not going to go into detail now, is, well, does that cause short cycling of your compressor? And we've looked in some detail at that, and there's certainly a, it causes a reduction in the cycle time of compressor, but we can mitigate any issue for short cycling. Okay, so um, uh, then we looked at a few different cases for how much p communication and sensing equipment we would need. So we, we set up a reference case where what if we can meter power and temperature at all controlled loads, and we use that to parameterize the, or to recover the states in our LTI model and um, follow what looks like a load following signal with the loads. And in that case, in simulation, we can get 6% RMS error, so that's quite good. And let me just jump then to case two where we said, what if we meter only the aggregate power at the distribution substation, um, uh, and in, in that case, and then broadcast signals back out to loads. With, in that case, we can recover the states on the loads well enough with that LTI model to get 5% RMS error. And it turns out that that compares favorably with what an actual generator could do with a signal, a control signal from a system operator. Um, so we spent a fair bit of time also thinking about if we executed these kinds of control strategies, again, at the level of the state of California, how big is the resource? How much demand response could we get? And the way that we answered that question was by basically merging together a lot of data from the California Energy Commission, um, forecasting what electricity loads will look like in the future, and also a lot of climatological data to forecast how the load availability changes in time. Um, and sort of mooshing all of that together, we get this is just sort of like the high level answer to the question, how big is the resource? So if we were to control air condition, residential air conditioners, water heaters, and um, refrigerators in the state of California, um, according to this model, we would have a resource size of 40 gigawatts for load following. And for reference, that's two, three gorges dams, uh, or 10 gigawatt hours of energy storage. Um, and that's two, three, gor three, three gorges, that is the three gorges dam at full output for 30 minutes. So um, now, but one important thing that I should heavy caveat is that this is in the best case scenario. That is all air conditioners are operating, um, all the water heaters are operating. And of course, um, right now, even in Texas, you don't have to have your air conditioners on. And so that resource wouldn't be there all the time. And that's an important issue to think about. Um, so we also did some things to hang dollar numbers on what the value might be for individual appliances um, and looked at, um, I won't go into detail on how we got the, the dollar number to apply to the available. Basically, we started with dollar numbers that were dollars per megawatt or dollars per megawatt hour, and we applied those to get per unit, per air conditioner, per water heater, per air conditioner heat pump, how much, what value is there on an annual basis. So you can see that some of these numbers are maybe big enough to get people interested in participating. So one way to think about this is that this is the most that you could give a customer for the authority, in exchange for the authority to control their loads, right? I'm gonna, I see a couple of questions, but let me just finish up the last little bit and then we can talk about it. Um, so what you can see is some of the numbers are super small uh, some of the numbers are maybe big enough to encourage um, participation. But so certainly an important question, though, is will people do it? And I think that, so this is one thing that we're working on now in the future, is to say, what if instead of giving people a financial compensation, we say, you're balancing renewables, right? And so there are some people that would feel a warm or a green glow from that, right, and would actually say, I'd like to know that my loads are operating when renewables are. Another thing that we're looking at um, in a pilot project is to say, what if we pay people uh, in lottery tickets, right? So instead of getting paid 10 bucks, you get a one in a thousand chance of winning $10,000, right? Um, that, that might work. I talked a little bit about the seasonality stuff. And validation is one thing that we haven't, we need to do this on a real physical system. It's all been simulation so far, and we're talking with a few demand response providers to do that sort of thing. 
So um, I've got a few concluding remarks. It's mostly stuff that I've said already, so I'll go ahead and just stop here and um, finish in the 10 minutes that Varun gave me. So thanks for your attention. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I think there are a few questions there. The, both, both. Okay, yeah, maybe somebody that hasn't asked yet. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. That's interesting. I have uh, a question on your um, the, the first part of your uh, presentation. I guess two questions. How or can you expand on how you discuss the regulation of, say, the, the Mojave Desert situation, the all concentrated there on the four kilometer county and statewide scale, since all the PV generation would be coming from one spot, so why would the regulation be different depending on the scale of, uh, I guess, where the regulation is coming from? Okay. And the second is, uh, I guess, you, you model capacity and not electricity generation, so is it how, I guess, ex can you expand a little bit upon, I'm assuming the Mojave Desert will have more electricity generation for the same capacity, and yeah. so are you saying, I need more flexibility because I have more electricity generation? and. Less no, so, so it's the same, yeah, that, that one's e I can answer both, but the, the second question is a little easier because, yes, we put, in, when we did the state level analysis, we, we set 12 gigawatts of capacity. Mojave Desert is going to have a better capacity factor, right? So there's more energy per unit of capacity, um, but, uh, but the, the volatility is coming from... Uh, the, the increased volatility is coming from the fact that these things are spatially clustered together. Now, I think a fair point is that if you divide, if you think about the amount of additional capacity you need per unit of energy, maybe they're comparable. Um, uh, we didn't actually compute that, but the, I know that it's still going to be more in the Mojave because um, our numbers show that it's even more than double the load following requirement if we go from fully distributed to centralized in the Mojave and the improvement in capacity factor is not that large. Um, so then um, I have some supplemental slides to talk a little bit about these different scenarios. So um, the idea is that in the distributed scenario we choose as I suggested randomly from we also looked at a six gigawatt scenario but I didn't give those results but it's exactly the same approach. Um, we choose randomly uh, locations from within a four kilometer square grid cell and the community scale we take that same amount of capacity and stick it all in the middle. In these two cases we need the same total number of grid cells to make our six or twelve gigawatts of total for the state um, and you can see here what it is. It's, we, we use um, about 2400 grid cells because that's the number of cells that we had 15 minute data for. So basically what that means is that uh, in the distributed case, we put 1,000 5 kilowatt systems for the 12 gigawatt scenario, 1,000 5 kilowatt systems into that box, and then we do that 2,400 times, and that gives us um, roughly the number that we need. So, but then in the centralized case, we say just pack it up, put as much in there as we can, subject to having the appropriate ground coverage ratio on the PV. Um, and then uh, stick all of that in the most central place we can. So in this case, what we did is we, th this is a map of solar resource availability um, from the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, and we had data, 15-minute uh, data, in these uh, four areas. And we just loaded them up with as much PV as we could. So coming back to then um, the results here, so what's happening is that, so the question was about the different scenarios for distribution, not the different scenarios for balancing, right? Oh, the difference between the, I guess the difference between the having to deal with volatility or regulation specifically for the centralized case. Yeah. Why it's so different from state to county or nearby balancing. Um, I was assuming they were all coming ah, from the same spot. Sorry, for the district. Oh, okay. I'm sorry before, before I didn't get your... Right, so wait, so you're saying for these three distributed cases, for example, so if we look at distributed state level, county, and four we kilometers? Just look at centralized state level, oh. county. Oh, okay, sure. Ah, perfect, okay. So um, uh, in that case even, so if you go back to, so 
first of all, if it's the four kilometer square centralized case, um, let me go again, sorry, the slide's not easily accessed, but um, okay. So um, each one of these things is a four kilometer square cell. So we're assuming that we're balancing at that level rather than summing all of these things together and balancing at that level. And so even that amount of spatial averaging that happens when we sum everything together um, is enough to give that change in the way that the bars are distributed. Hopefully that answers the question. I, I got off a little bit on the wrong tangent for a second, but. That answers a lot of questions. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, oh, sure, okay. Um, th th there's one that hasn't asked a question yet, so yeah. First of all, thanks a lot, that was a great talk. <clears throat> this might be going into the weeds a little bit, but I was hoping you could uh, maybe show some additional uh, diagnostic plots for the, uh, the spatial autocorrelation model. Oh, sure. Well, so one thing I can show you at least is <clears throat> this one, which is, um, so these red lines are what we fit. Uh, that's our exponential decay. Um, and then the, the gray circles are uh, our actual data in terms of the correlation between individual sites. Um, so you can ask questions about that, or maybe that's enough to that's sort of suggest what we're what we're getting. Yep. Okay. Good. Get that, guys. Now, question two. Uh, so, do the loads individually respond independently to the changes in the volatility states without your control input? Can they? Uh, does what independently the loads? Can they respond independently? Oh, you're making a connection that I haven't thought about before. So you're saying. We've got volatility states from the PV, and then we've got loads. Uh, so, um, so, so they certainly could independently respond, and that would result in something that's at least comparable to that four kilometer square balancing area scenario in terms of how much they'd have to move around. Um, but oh, so let me say, I'm not sure if I answer your question entirely, but, but I just want to say at least one thing, which is that so. Um, so as much as I was kind of bashing that four kilometer square scenario by saying, oh, look, we need so much more capacity. On the flip side, there is potentially, you know, you know, virtually limitless capacity in the DR resource, according to the second part of the talk. So, um, so it could be that, you know, even though we need a lot more, if it's easy to enroll customers in this kind of a program, um, maybe that is the answer. Um, as long as, because there is just so much resource available. Yeah. Carrying on on that, it, it seems like, say, a residential house could have its own hems and maybe modulate its own loads based upon its own PV. Output. Right, yeah, exactly. So that's when I thank you for being here. This is very interesting. So okay, you're thanks. You're listening to a lot of great questions because we're all interested in it. Um, one of the questions was, um, the communication cost. I noticed that you had a, an estimate for value over the course of a year. Yeah. It looks like reg up and reg down from the AC. That is when you say regulation, reg up, reg Frequency down. reg, yep. Okay. And one of the questions that we've gone through and haven't gotten an answer for is, you know, how much does it really cost to have, are you on four second AGC? Four second by four second in Cal ISO? That's yep. ERCOT is. Yep. To have, you know, four seconds isn't that, you know, short of a latency in the modern world, but when we see some of the links, uh, you know, who knows how many layers and hops there are right. to get to the device. Right. And so what kind of sizing have you estimated for the communication cost per month or year to have a relatively low latency, reliable, secure link yeah. to make all that wondrous stuff happen? I cop out on this answer. Yeah, we, we you know, keep keep going, but and the second thing is, is that I'm optimistic when you go to the next step and you look at the net load versus just PV because it would seem like when there's cloud cover, not only will that cut PV production, but it'll cut a AC load, and AC load is probably yeah. one of your dominant loads, so the picture may get better and easier. Perhaps, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, on 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 the first part, um, yeah, we don't so. Um, yeah, I just I try as much as possible not to have to worry about sort of like getting, you know, specific costs for individual types of networking equipment. It's not my background to do networking stuff, and so I'm I don't know on the cost side of things what it would look like. Um, one one thing that I will say though is that um, 
There, maybe you're familiar with uh, the work that they've done at Pacific Northwest National Labs. Yuri Makarov has been involved in this where they've said, um, okay, let, let's take a look at the signals that um, generators are getting for AGC, four second signals, and let's compare that to what they're actually doing. Um, and there's roughly a one to two minute lag between what they're being told to do and what they're actually doing, right? So even though I think that there's, I got confused about this and um, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know already, but when I first started learning about frequency regulation and oh, it's four second timescale commands, I thought that's pretty high performance standards. But the thing, so the, just because the command arrives every four seconds, that doesn't mean that the resource is actually able to or even required to do exactly what it's being told to do every four seconds. So I think it would be, I guess, the, I'm saying that because I think it would be tolerable if the communication system had some delay or some dropped packets. Um, yeah. And then energy arbitrage. I mean, yeah. I think of that in terms of buy low, sell high. Yeah. And I think of that as far as storage elements or vehicles or whatever. How do you arbitrage an air? Is this like a, an ice bear? No. So this is just, this is actually this scenario. And I, this is a whole paper that I gave you in one slide. So. My apologies, but the idea is that we um, uh, we take uh, five-minute locational marginal prices, um, and we attempt to control the aggregation of loads to minimize the cost to procure electricity, subject to the constraint that those loads still stay within that hysteresis loop. So we're not arbitraging across like hours, we're arbitraging across, you know, a few five minute intervals. And so it's really in many respects, it's driven by big price changes, like this kind of thing right here. So in this case, we didn't have capacity available to respond, but to the extent there's this big change from high to low price, if you can hold your breath just a little bit and wait until the price is low, then exactly. Yes. Yep. Sure.